Egypt, the Sphinx. In the undulating desert near Giza rise three mighty pyramids, the tombs of the three kings, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkure. At the foot of the pyramids crouches the Sphinx, with talons outstretched over the city of the dead, guarding the magical secrets gathered therein. In front of the pyramids, says Pliny, is the Sphinx, a still more wondrous object of art, but upon which rests a spell of silence, as it is looked upon as a deity. The Sphinx imposes silence. The 13th century Arab writer Abd al-Latif tells us that the true reason why all mention of this monument has been avoided was the terror it inspired. During that epoch, its face and figure were still beautiful, and its mouth, Abd al-Latif relates, bore the imprint of grace and beauty, as if it were smiling. The huge head, refulgent with red varnish, was still untarnished at that time. The Arabs named it Abu al-Hawl, Father of Terror. Fourteen centuries before Christ, so we read on the flat stone leaning against its breast, the giant already lay buried in the shifting sand. By the time the Sphinx was already ageless, its origin blurred in legend. Fourteen hundred years before our era, a prince, later Thutmose IV, took his siesta in the shadow of the half-submerged Sphinx. He had been throwing spheres and hunting in the neighborhood when the hour came in which he granted rest to his followers. Alone in the noontime solitude, he offered flower seeds to Horus, for great enchantment rests upon the place from the beginning of time. Whereupon the sun god, whose image the Sphinx was then believed to be, appeared in a dream to the prince and spoke to him as the father to his son, after promising that he would succeed to the throne and enjoy a long and happy reign, the god urged the prince to have the sphinx cleared of sand. Promise me that thou wilt do what I wish with all my heart. Then I shall know whether thou art my son and my helper. When later, contrary to his expectations, the prince was raised to kingship, he remembered his dream and obeying the god's will, ordered the sphinx to be dug out of the sands. However, the sands of the desert continued their ceaseless labor, and a few hundred years later the monster was again buried beneath the dunes, as man and desert fought to possess the hewn rock. In his book, Isis and Osiris, Plutarch says that the Sphinx symbolizes the secret of occult wisdom. Elsewhere, he describes it as a magnificent creature having wings of ever-changing hue. When turned toward the sun, they glitter like gold. When towards the clouds, they shine with the reflection of rainbow colors. But even Plutarch, that assiduous investigator, failed to penetrate the mystery. For countless ages, the Sphinx remained the guardian of Egyptian magic. Plutarch assures us that, in their desire to converse with its priests, many Greek thinkers, Solon, Thales, Pythagoras, Eudoxus, even Lycurgus himself, undertook the arduous journey to Egypt. The Egyptians believed that each priestly word, each priestly gesture, had a marvelous effect. Mysterious magical power resided in certain persons, and the greater the mana, or magic tension, the more astounding the marvels they could induce. The pharaoh was so charged with this power that by merely raising his hand he could make the earth tremble. For this reason, perhaps, the king, when not depicted in the midst of a well-defined action, was usually portrayed in the pose of immobility, so that no danger might result from an involuntary movement of his. For the manna resided not only in the person, but in the image, too. In the Nile lands, images had, from ancient times, been treated as living, active beings. Since the beginning, Egypt had been the home of magical statues whose occult powers could affect the physical world. Thus the awesome figures of the guardian sphinxes before the temples did more than frighten away the profane. They could reward and punish, as could the king himself whose image they originally represented. The sphinxes opened their stone mouths and revealed the will of the gods. The fathers of the Christian church distinctly vouched for the phenomenon that statues could speak. The king and the assembled people were often present at this oracle, and scribes wrote down the words on their papyri. In the Siwa oasis stood the image of Ammon, to which Alexander the Great once made a pilgrimage. Ammon promised something dazzling to the Macedonian, mastery over the earth. 
Images accomplished still greater wonders. Often they would descend from their pedestals to walk among men. Thus, during the reign of King Hatshepsut, the god Amnon strode through the temple halls at Karnak, stopping before a youth, later to be Tutmos III. The young man knelt before the god, but Ammon raised him up and bade him to take the place that was the king's. Through this divine coup d'etat, Thutmos became sovereign. Human reason is silenced when Ammon intervenes in a dynastic matter. Whenever the sculptor's chisel molds the amorphous mass into an image, whenever he portrays an organism, magical power flows into the statue a power which may be imprisoned within it by incarnation and magical gesture, and which gives life to the image so long as it remains whole. When it is broken, its soul escapes. Demons hostile to men are for this reason cut through on the hieroglyphic reliefs, so that the sign may have no evil influence. But what power can disturb the magic virtue of the Sphinx or drive away the spirit that inhabits it? Thousands of chisels carve the rock, when nature failed, masonry was introduced. This colossus, half-hewn, half-sculpted, has defied millennia. Never in the history of mankind has a statue so lastingly caught the imagination of peoples. The thoughts of countless generations dwell in it. Numberless conjurations and rites have built up in it a mighty protective spirit, a soul that still inhabits this time-scarred giant.